end. Here we go. Hello, and welcome to our third annual Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design Speaker Series. To paraphrase James Baldwin, nothing can be changed until it is faced. And this is certainly true of the inequities that have historically shaped the digital media industries, both on screen and behind the scenes. This event is brought to you by UConn's Department of Digital Media and Design. We would like to begin today's event by acknowledging that the land on which we gather here in Stores, Connecticut, is the territory of the Mohegan, Manchatucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pagasut, Nipmunk, and Lenape peoples that have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and their resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Today's event will feature a presentation by our guest speaker, Andrew Wolf, who is presenting Love Wins, Solving LGBTQ Problems, through UX design, followed by a Q&A featuring questions from the virtual audience and led by our students. Please take advantage of the YouTube chat box to submit questions for our guests, which we will try to answer during our discussion. My name is Heather Elliott Famolaro, and I'm the, a digital artist and a documentary filmmaker. And most importantly for today, I'm the department head for digital media and design at the University of Connecticut. Uh, DMD is a young department founded in 2013, which has rapidly grown to over 350 undergraduate and graduate students and 26 full-time faculty. We have seven undergraduate concentrations across the full digital media spectrum from interactive media, which we'll be talking about today, film production, animation, digital business strategies, and the humanities at both the stores and Stanford campuses. In our department, we value and celebrate our students' diverse backgrounds, and we support their development both as individuals and as professional media creators. The Diverse Protectives in Digital Media and Design Speaker Series is one celebration of those shared values. So now onto the tonight's show. It's my pleasure to welcome today's co-host. Professor Clarissa Seglio is a US cultural historian trained in the interdisciplinary field of American studies, whose work at the intersections of museum studies, public history, and digital humanities. Her book, A Cultural Arsenal for Democracy, The World War II Work of U.S. Museums, published by Ma University of Massachusetts Press in 2022, traces how, from the 1930s through to the immediate post-war years, the fledgling ideal of the museum as a social instrument active and current affairs led to new modes of storytelling through exhibition craft. Through her, in, her teaching and research, Seglio also collaborates with museums, libraries, and communities on interdisciplinary public-facing projects that engage diverse audiences in topics of very important contemporary concern. Thanks so much, Heather. And I'm also happy to introduce our student co-hosts. We've got Harum Jamil and Delaney Nagy. Harum Jamil is a creative, open-minded, and passionate individual who strives to make a website unique and aesthetic while still maintaining its functionality. She is currently a senior focusing on web and interactive media while pursuing her BA in DMD. Welcome, Harum. Thank you for, thank you. Happy to be here. And then we also have Delaney Nagy, who is currently a sophomore in the film and video production concentration within DMD, working towards her BFA while pursuing opportunities in the film industry. So welcome. Thank you, glad to be here. All right, and now Clarissa, allow me to hand over the virtual mic to help you, uh, allow you to introduce our wonderful guest speaker. Thank you, Heather. It is my sincere pleasure not only to welcome today's guest, who is a class of 2018 UConn Digital Media and Design alum, Andrew Welsh. Andrew Welsh, oh my gosh, that's my nephew, Andrew Wolf. <laughs> but to welcome him virtually home to DMD. Today, Andrew is a senior product designer at Rocked 
an A1 hypergrowth series e startup that improves the centralization and relevancy of online advertisements. As part of the company's experimentation team, he builds enterprise desktop tools that enable Rocked employees and clients to test the impact that changes in ad design and placement will have on outcomes. Earlier in his career, which you're going to learn a lot more about from him directly, Andrew started work as a junior UX researcher and designer at NBC Universal in New York City, and after that as a senior product designer at Meta in its enterprise infrastructure and security organization. So without any further commentary, I'd like to turn uh, the wheel over to Andrew, who's going to take us into a deep dive of his own career and the subject matter at hand. Um, thank you for the introduction, Professor Seglio. Um, hello, everyone. Andrew Wolf, class of DMD class of 2018. Like I said, I'm super excited and honored to be back and share my experiences and um, hopefully you all learn a lot and let's get started. So we're going to share my screen. Can everyone see the presentation? Cool. So um, yeah, Professor Seigler reached out um, to be part of the series uh, with the theme of, you know, diversity and um, you know, my sexual identity is gay. So, you know, I'd love to explore the subject of solving LGBTQ problems through UX design and, you know, also talk about my career experience, um, how I decided to become a UX designer. And um, I'm gonna explore some of the history of LGBTQ design campaigning, um, talk about some recent trends to cater the needs of like non-binary and trans people, and then also dive into um, some design heuristics, uh, specifically the laws of simplicity by John Media, and um, talk about a case study of how an LG BQ2 app was um, designed following those rules. So without further ado, let's get started. So every design begins with an even better story, right? Um, thinking about users, you know, everyone's so diverse, has their own unique experiences, and you know, building great products starts with hearing people out, understanding their stories, you know, identifying touch points, and um, hearing diverse perspectives that aligns with the design thinking process. Um, so you want you want to have a really open mind and um, start design with the story, which obviously begins with the problem too. Um, so I guess my story. Um, here's some cute pictures of me when I was young. Um, I was born in 1995. I'm 27 now. And from a very young age, you know, I was really interested in art. I took a lot of art classes. Um, on the right here was my eighth grade um, art showcase during like a school presentation. Um, the bottom left here was a charcoal drawing I made in high school that I won an award for. It was hung up in a museum. So, um, yeah, it was very interested in the arts growing up in design and, you know, also played around with, you know, Tumblr and making layouts for and customization of some CSS. And, um, but I kind of had a conflicting um, kind of problem because I come from a family of athletes. Uh, my dad is an Olympic shot putter and um, all my siblings like had their sports. They ended up going to college for sports and my dad really wanted me to do that too. But, um, you know, ultimately I had to tell him that I wasn't gonna go to school for rowing, you know, it wasn't me. And uh, luckily I found UConn Digital Media and got accepted and um, the rest is history. So um, due to my background in art, I decided to go on the BFA track. And um, so I guess my professional story now, um, when I went into DMD, I thought I was going to be an animator. Um, specifically, I wanted to make the visuals behind DJs at concerts. You know, I thought that was so cool. So, you know, started my freshman year classes, um, taking 
intro to animation, um, like animation two. And then my sophomore year, um, I took intro to web design and uh, I thought coding was really, really fun and interesting. Um, I liked, you know, thinking about hierarchy, visual layouts, and had a lot of fun making websites. So I started coding websites on the side um, for, for some money outside of classes. And there was a couple of pivotal moments that made me decide I wanted to break into this field professionally, opposed to animation. Um, I guess the first one in Joel's class, he showed a video of like a future smart home where there were screens everywhere in the air, on the fridge, on the kitchen counter. And I was like, wow, you know, we're so, so young in its infancy stage of digital technology. And there's just so many possibilities and um, products to be made. So that got me really excited. And um, another pivotal moment was, actually, I'll get to that in a bit, but I didn't know know what UX was for a while. Like I kept seeing UX and job listings, and then it wasn't until like mid sophomore year I discovered that was an actual career. And you know, understanding that design is not just surface level; it's a lot deeper in research and processes. Um, so yeah, I decided to center my classes around UX. I took some classes in the psychology department. Um, I took all the interactive media classes. I seeked opportunities outside classes. You know, I, in the digital agency class followed the design process. And my next pivotal moment when I decided to become a UX designer, um, for in Professor Saglio's class for extra credit, I was a usability test participant for Omega Everywhere, which is a museum archive viewer, um, collection viewer. Um, it was like this big giant touch table it was super cool and there's also a mobile pairing app to view the collections so um and i thought it was so interesting how someone's own conceptual model of how our products works is very could be very different than the designer's intention and you know identifying those discrepancies and finding ways to make it all aligned i felt like was super fun and cool <clears throat> so like the intersection of you know, empathy, art, business, technology, um, and UX as a field being very collaborative and, you know, driving a product vision, being a leader. Um, and I'm very outgoing. I, I love talking to people. So I really felt like UX was a career for me. And uh, can you guys see the right? Is is the, I, I, there's like the profiles from Zoom. I don't know if it's covering the presentation. No, okay, good. I don't think so. Um, cool. So, um, so yeah, with the help of Professor Seglio, um, we both conducted the next round of usability testing for Amenka Everywhere. I applied for the share award at UConn and got accepted. Um, so I I had a showcase. I made a big board of my work that I believe is hanging up in the DMD department somewhere. Um, but uh, so then moving along. Um, towards the end of my years at UConn, I really started to master UX design tools. Um, first it was Sketch, but the industry has moved to Figma because um, it's online based, kind of like a Google Drive for design. And there's a lot of really good features in there. So if you're thinking about breaking into UX, definitely advise that you um, learn Figma and watch a lot of tutorials. So. Um, with my digital agency work, my Omeka Everywhere project, and some websites I designed, I had a portfolio already by the time I was starting to apply to colleges my senior year, and I was a BFA track, so I made um, like a website for it and um, started applying to a lot of jobs, got a lead at NBC Universal, um, got accepted. So I started there as a junior UX researcher intern and designer in um, 2018. Um, it was an enterprise software team for internal tools. So I didn't necessarily decide I wanted to get into internal tools, but I fell in love with it actually, because it's really rewarding taking a super complex problem and workflow and making it simple. And I think like dashboard design is really fun. And I like working on internal tools too, because 
um, employees are really willing to help out. So you have a lot of access for like interview subjects or research. Um, so that led me into my next role at Meta. Uh, also worked on internal tools there. I started there March 2020. I had a week in the office before the COVID lockdown. It was really hard, but uh, you know that made me stronger. And I was the first designer on my team there. So you know, really had to build the design process and ended up mentoring designers that joined after me, got promoted to senior level after like a year and a half. And um, I was definitely interested in working on other projects besides tools for engineers. You know, it was a lot of like database, database provisioning, application provisioning. And um, I found out about Rocked. I was really interested in joining a smaller company, you know, to kind of feel like I'm making a bigger impact at an earlier stage. And I really fell in love with the culture of Rock during the interview process. So I accepted a job there. I started last December. Um, so it's been a bit over three months and I'm super happy there. As Professor Sefleo said, I'm working on experimentation team. So building a platform to roll out small incremental changes to add to seeing what performs better. Um, so yeah, that's my professional story. And uh, I have no regrets going down my route um, and not being an athlete like my dad wanted me to do. And digital media prepared me so well for my career. You know, it's really focused on um, diversion thinking. So starting with the problem and um, breaking out opposed to like conversion thinking, which is more traditional learning, like um, multiple choice converging on a single answer. And all the group projects that you guys do in digital media, um, it's so relevant to the type of work you'll do in the real world. So yeah, thank you everyone at digital media. Cause I wouldn't have got to where I am today without PMD. Okay. So next, um, like I said, I specialize in enterprise desktop software. Um, so on the left here is the Vuln tool I made for meta. So thinking about, um, ways hackers could break into our systems, um, and creating a remediation workflow to like make like software upgrades to remove the vulnerabilities. Um, on the right here is a tool I made at NBC Universal called LiveShot Manager. Um, this is a, we digitize the live news workflow in the control rooms. It used to be very analog, like they had a conductor and they turned a knob to route the signals from like a reporter to a, an anchor or like um, one of the hosts of a news, so we built a workflow for the producers to set up all the um, different segments of the show. And then a lot of functionality of breaking new situations, all the technical people who are at the calls. So that's on the right. Um, some more examples of my work here on the left is a tool to allow meta employees to offer their files before they leave the company. There's a lot of security risks involved when they don't do that. Um, so I created a workflow around that. And on the right is something I'm working on now at Rocked, um, so the experimentation platform. So um, you see here, there's like the baseline ad, and then we have different variants. Um, so you could track the success metrics, um, like impressions, and then you could segment the results by like age, device, gender, vertical, like whether it's entertainment industry or retail. Um, yeah, and I'm really enjoying my work. So that's my story about how I broke into UX and for you guys that break into UX, um, obviously seek opportunities outside your classes and grow your portfolio. And what really makes you stand out is that your portfolio must be a story. Um, so it's not just starting with the problem and showing the final designs like at the top here. Um, employers really want to see your process and how you got from point A, B, to C. Um, what really makes you stand out too is communicating your failures and how you overcame them. It's okay to you know show you're not perfect and vulnerable because how you overcame them is you're gonna you're gonna fail in um, your professional world sometimes it's not always gonna be perfect so um, it's okay to communicate that um, how you have difference of opinion and move forward and compromises to meet engineering needs um, these are all super important items that your portfolio must convey and as a young designer. Um, who hasn't had an official UX role yet, um, really communicate your passion during your interviews. Um, 
be prepared to have your story about why you decided to become a UX designer and you know what makes you tick. Um, obviously, be yourself and humble during interviewing. I always like to pretend as a coffee talk to put my anxiety at ease and send thank you notes. Um, so that's some advice for you guys looking for your first role. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about LGBTQ design history, um, specifically in campaigning. And this isn't necessarily UX because um, there wasn't much technology back in like the 60s and stuff. But uh, I just want to set the stage for some of the issues that LGBTQ people face and how the campaign design um, evolved. So in the 1950s and 60s, um, before the Stonewall riots, which happened in 1969, which was a big um, police raid at the Stonewall Inn in our West Village in New York City, that started um, a couple day riot. And you know that's when the LGBT community really fought up to fight. Um, and that's the official start of the LGBTQ rights movement. But before that, there was a lot more quiet approach to campaigning. Um, so in, in this example, it's the Mattachine Society of New York. Um, you can see the big headline is homosexuals are different, which kind of aligns with the general opinion at the time. And then they say, but, and then the actual message they want to convey is super small text. So um, it was very conciliatory in nature and um, gradualistic. And um, this was kind of the general campaign methods before the Stonewall riots. Whoops. Then after the Stonewall riots, um, what did continue with the campaign style was the, the handmade style because it came to represent the authenticity of LGBTQ identities and demands. Um, but what's different now is that the campaigning was a lot more bold, highly visible, and uncompromising. So, you know, previously the the use of the word homosexual, but now they're saying, you know, gay liberation. Um, you know, they're using the fist that's um, synonymous with like army fighting. Um, you see down at the bottom, it's very bold letters and contrasts on the black and white background. And um, they also use the biological sex symbols um, to really communicate a strong message that it's okay that you know we're we're gay we're proud and it's happening and you know we demand more rights so um campaigning continued to get a lot more bold um and this um in 1978 the first pride flag was designed by gilbert baker and you know opposed to the black and white campaigning in the past um, the colors symbolized that the darkest days were over and also represented the diversity of the identities and, you know, races of the LGBT community. Um, and it was originally, um, I think, eight stripes. Um, and you could read here what each of those colors meant. Um, and there's a lot of iterations of this flag over time. Eventually, the colors were changed just to six to make it a bit more bold and recognizable as like a universal rainbow symbol. And most recently in 2018, um, Daniel Quisar designed what's called the progress pride flag. So a chevron was added to the left here, pointing to the right. So indicating forward movement. And um, it brings up more modern issues that, well, there's, there have always been issues, but more like, issues that are um, rising up in like what people are talking about. So the white, pink, and blue stripes represents trans and non-binary people. And the brown and, and black stripes represent marginalized people of color who unfortunately historically face a lot more oppression and um, hardship compared to other counterparts. And the black stripe um, also has double meaning to fight the AIDS and HIV stigma. Um, so now in the 1980s, um, you know, design continued to draw from social and emotional symbols from wider culture. Um, so the silence equals death campaign um, appeared in the 1980s. And this pink triangle um, during World War II and the Nazi concentration camps, if you were discovered to be LGBTQ, um, you were forced to wear this 
pink triangle facing downwards um, to kind of, you know, sh shame them and, you know, make them visible and, you know, pointing downwards, meaning they're lower. Um, so this symbol was um, utilized for the Silent Seagulls death campaign, um, which was for awareness of the AIDS epidemic. And the triangle was inverted upwards to, um, you know, indicate growth and, you know, that people are fighting and we're trying to find, you know, health solutions and um, indicating progress again. And then in the 1990s, um, the Human Rights Campaign logo was formed. So it was, there was a shift here to more contemporary branding um, that was, you know, more popular in the time compared to like some of the more handmade styles of the past. And this was more subtle to kind of suggest that LGBTQ people are not that different from everyone else. You know, they're trying to kind of fit in with the design trends at the time and not be so radically out there. And again, they utilize the symbol, um, universally known equal sign in order to challenge mainstream attitudes. And this frames same-sex marriage as an issue of equality, um, you know, opposed to saying that we're different. And in 2013, the US Supreme Court he hearings were happening. And um, another version of this was changed to red to be synonymous with love. And there was a big campaign by Facebook where people overlaid this red um, human rights logo over their profile images. And Facebook saw 120% increase in profile photo updates. So it was a really successful campaign. And obviously, the US Supreme Court allowed gay marriage, which was a huge win. So, you know, in summary, like design needs to be inclusive for all. Um, you know, thinking about accessibility and, you know, different perspectives. Like I said, everyone has their own story. And um, here are just some other um, LGBTQ flags that have arose over the years. Um, so there's a lot of various identities. And when you think about product design, it's important to know um, all your users who you're designing for and understand their needs. And um, each of these flags have like specific colors and stuff to communicate um, different various needs of these identities. So some inclusive design tips. Uh, it first starts with hiring and team building. You know, thinking about the design thinking process, you really want to have diversity of thought and having a team that's diverse in um, gender identities, sexual identities, race, ages is super important. So you could build off each other's experiences and ideas and um, move forward. You also want to question assumptions. So you don't want to assume what you know about someone's experience is right. Um, you want to, you know, think about your gaps in research and then find what you need to actually make the design inclusive, um, such as product features. You also want to set up your product design principles. So thinking about the gist of your product and what it's trying to solve, you want to use that information to determine your, you know, color palettes, your typography, even your design system and the individual components and how they interact. Um, it's all super important to align it back to your product vision. Um, obviously, you want to conduct inclusive UX research. So um, you want to make sure that when you're doing your recruiting for test participants or usability testing or interviewing, um, it has a diverse range of, um, like I said, ages, races, um, gender identities, especially if you're trying to build a product for LGBTQ people. Um, next, what users say is very different than what they do. Um, so what's best practice in UX is actually observe user behavior um, rather than asking them what users need, because generally when you ask people what they need, um, they don't necessarily know. So um, you find that information actually by observing user behavior. So you could you know, shadow people on their day-to-day -day work, use some diary studies, um, desk research. Um, I'll, explore, I'll explain some other methods for this later on. And lastly, you wanna attend key touch points in the user journey. So, you know, based off someone's experience, you may find that um, when you lay out the user journey and you do an exercise to like idea and solutions, each touch point has various 
um, needs that are super important. You know, for example, um, users might LGBTQ users when they're um, let's say looking for a doctor, they might be scared that the doctor will not be gay friendly. So, you know, ha having that touch point there and ideating on that solution is, you know, how you really make design inclusive. So this is a really famous quote by Albert Einstein. Um, he is basically saying if he had an hour to solve a problem, he spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper questions to ask, um, basically identifying the problem. And, um, and then he spent five minutes on the solution. So um, what I'm trying to get here that is that UX is much more than just coming up with ideas. You know, it's this UX research that really builds a great product and it's super critical um, to make design inclusive and really understand users' needs. And um, a lot of you may have seen this already um, if you're studying UX, but this, or even design thinking. Um, um, I, I learned this process when I took design thinking at DMD. But this is a double diamond approach. So you want to start with the challenge and then diverge on the problem space. Um, this is where you do your UX research and then converge on a problem definition. So this is what you thought was the problem. And in the middle is the actual problem to be solved. And once you have the real problem to be solved based off evidence, then you then diverge again on solutions. And then through user testing, um, other metrics, you then emerge on the best single outcome, which is how you build great products. Um, so Albert Einstein, said he'd spend the majority of the time in this phase opposed to the solution phase. Um, I wouldn't say that the 55 minutes, five minutes is always the case. Um, you know, each project and scenario has various needs that arise and it's often not linear like this either. You know, you'll pivot, um, maybe during user testing, you identify a new problem and have to go back to the challenge phase. So design is never linear, like I said, in the previous slide about your portfolio. Um, so it's you know really important to consider that as well. So um, in terms of, this is another famous UX um, item called the UX iceberg. So a lot of people, when they think about uh, design, um, they solely think of UI design and what people actually see, like the colors, um, how things look, but what people don't see is a UX research. So stuff like interviewing, persona, surveys, focus groups, diary studies, participatory design, um, card sorting. These are all methods that I use as a UX designer to really drill down on the problem to be solved. And, um, the, and there's different specialties in UX. Um, you might just wanna be a UI designer and that's totally fine. Um, I'm specifically a product designer, so it's a bit more all-encompassing of everything. So um, if you're able to master a lot of these techniques, uh, it would really make you stand out. And ultimately, this is how you build great products by doing that UX research. Um, so next, I'm going to pivot back to some LGBTQ problems. Um, just to kind of communicate, there's a lot of issues that still arise. There's still a lot of progress to be made and opportunities for products in this field. So um, two thirds of LGBTQ people have experienced violence or abuse. Almost one in five LGBTQ people have experienced homelessness at some point in their lives. 70 countries criminalize same-sex relationships and 11 of those have a death penalty. Um, more than a third of LGBTQ staff have hidden their identity at work out of fear of discrimination. Um, only one third of LGBTQ people who wanted support were able to access it. And um, LGBTQ students at schools are um, twice as more likely than to get bullied than non-LGBTQ people. So these are just some statistics. There's a lot more statistics out there that you know really communicate that this fight is not over. There's a lot of work to be done. And um, yeah, a lot of opportunities out there. So um, 
I wanted to get involved in these issues. Um, so there's a, a program called Out in Tech, which is a big network of um, LGBTQ people in the tech world and allies. And they have a program called the um, Digital Corps. I believe it's twice a year. So this program identifies LGBTQ organizations around the world. They don't have the resources, skills, or support to build their own you know, websites, et cetera. Um, so twice a year, it's like a day long workshop. Um, it was, I think it was like eight hours or so where you join a team. And um, the one I did on the left is a queer sister. So they're um, an organization in Armenia, which faces a lot of LGBTQ hate still. And this was a website. Um, so made, made in WordPress. Um, I, I utilize my WordPress skills from DMD to you know, customize it, but uh, yes, like a blog and um, really advise if you want to get involved and join this program, anyone can sign up. And because, like I said, there's a lot of issues still out there and um, changes to be made and products to be made. Um, so next I'm going to talk about some LGBTQ inclusive design case studies. So, um, First, you want to avoid um, gender binary defaults. So historically, driver's license, the sex, have just been male or female. And um, I, I guess, there's all, and for those of you who don't know the difference between sex and gender, so sex is what you're biologically born with. Um, but if you're transsexual and have surgery, you could change your sex. I'm sorry, it's not what you're biologically born with. It's what you currently have. And then gender is performative. So it's how you express yourself, whether um, masculine, feminine, non-binary, um, there's, there's androgamous, there's a lot of identities out there. Um, so go beyond just male and female, but really consider if you need to ask about gender at all. If you don't need it, don't ask and make gender questions optional for people that are uncomfortable sharing. And also enable a free text box so people can write in what they prefer to identify as if it's not listed. So um, yeah, the, a lot of states now off, offer option X on driver's licenses. Um, next, you wanna allow people to use their, their chosen name that matches their presentation. So nearly one third of trans and non-binary individuals say they have been harassed or denied service after showing an ID card that, not, that did not match their identity. Um, and dead naming refers to using the birth name um, opposed to what they identify as. So a lot of companies and programs have started addressing this problem. Um, specifically MasterCard here, listed here. Um, they have a, its true name program. So people could um, change their name on their credit card. That's not, you know, their legal name. And uh, I also believe a lot of states now enable you to change your name on your driver's license. So um, you always allow people to choose their chosen name. Um, similar to the first one, allow people to choose their own pronouns. Um, first one is more so about their um, like gender or sex, but pronouns is you know how they wanna be referred to as. And um, Lyft is one of the first large organizations to do this. So you see on the left here, um, people can select their pronouns, um, such as they, them, theirs, he, him, his, my pronoun is not listed, but for not to say. And then drivers would see their pronoun and um, you know be more informed and educated about various identities and um, raise more awareness of the, the identities out there. Um, next, don't use gender assumptions in avatar or profile settings. So, you know, historically, avatars have been a human silhouette, but there's basically nothing that you can do that with the human silhouette that won't be problematic. For example, it's generally male with short hair, females with long hair. And not only that, historically, they've also been white. Um, and there's obviously a lot of various races out there. And it really needs to reflect um, the diversity of people's skin color. Um, but to 
counteract that issue, um, you know, a lot of companies have started playing around with different ideas. Um, to see in the top left here, Google initially launched animals as by default profile settings. Um, but through testing, they discovered that people had a hard time recognizing who was who. Um, so eventually they changed the profile settings to initials. Um, and also want to allow people to upload their own profile photo if they're comfortable sharing it and you know want to be heard and um, visualized. So Mike, I rocked, we use Google Chat. So I see these letters all the time. Uh, another example, GitHub on the right here uses like these like Gamicon fun little icons and some more examples of smiley faces at the bottom is Vimeo, Dropbox, Yahoo, and Twitter left to right. Um, so yeah, be very careful about having a profile that makes assumptions about someone. It's best practice to use these more fun uh, settings. Um, next, you want to use diverse stock images that goes beyond the binary. So stock art can promote stereotypes. Historically, it's just been, you know, male, females, cis, straight. Um, so you need to make stock images inclusive for, you know, gay couples, lesbian couples, trans, non-binary people. Um, but you also need to move beyond LGBTQ stereotypes too. Um, you know, for example, if all your stock images are young gay men, you know, that's not good. That doesn't communicate the full spectrum of various races and ages of um, get LGBTQ people out there. And the bottom photo um, launched in 2009. It's an old laughing lesbian couple. And I, it actually became the first LGBTQ top seller image of Getty Images for the first time. Um, so there's really been a lot of social progress and uh, being more aware of different identities out there and I'm utilizing them in products, um, commercials, uh, websites, et cetera. Um, next, you don't wanna rely on stereotypes for representing gender data. So, you know, historically, you know, pink for girls, um, blue for boys. Um, and this example is actually inverted, but um, you get the point. So, you know, pink often we align in Western culture with like dolls and um, femininity, you know, being as strong as boys, we were like um, supposed to be tough and rough. So, you know, a lot of identities don't um, align with this binary. So um, it's important to move away from pink and blue when representing gender. Um, it's also important to add another option. And when you think about the use of color in representing data, it's also super critical is accessibility. So thinking about um, various um, colorblind people, there, there's different um, types of colorblindness. So you need to make sure it passes the accessibility standards so colorblind people can still see the difference. Um, and next, you really wanna, similar to the one of the inclusive tips I shared earlier, you wanna think about user journeys of your LGBTQ customers, which often is very different than other users. Um, for example, when LGBTQ people want to travel, they may be concerned if the region is safe for them to go to. Um, and they also want to know where they could find other LGBTQ events. So booking.com created an exclusive experience for LGBTQ travelers. Um, another example is Grindr, which is a popular gay dating app. So the image at the top right here, that's the app icon when you download it on your iPhone or Android, but it's very, it's pretty universally recognizable at this point. And, you know, a lot of people may be in the closet, um, their families may be anti-gay. So Grindr allowed the ability to change the at homepage app icon as something discreet and different. So if, you know, a friend goes with someone's phone, they wouldn't see the Grindr um, app icon. Another example, um, ZocDoc. Um, allowed users to search by gay-friendly doctors. So, you know, really going back to your UX research, um, mapping out that user journey is where you'll find these aha moments to really build meaningful products. Um, something else 
I'm going to talk about now is the laws of simplicity. So these are 10 rules uh, made by John uh, Media, who's a really big pioneer of you know, design and UX. So I was um, at the MIT Museum sometime in college when I had a club swim team meet there. And uh, I saw this book and I bought it. And it's been really critical for how I think about design. And I tr try my best to apply these principles um, all the time. So um, the first law is reduce. So the easiest way to simplify a system is to remove functionality. Uh, when in doubt, just remove things, but be very careful what you remove. So, you know, for example, um, let's say I recently had a design critique where I had an eye icon to view something. And then one of the designers was like, do you really need that there? Like, why don't you have a unhover change the cursor to be like a point, a click pointer? Um, so really think critically about what you can reduce. But it's also a complex task thinking about, you know, finding the balance of making it simple um, through this reduction. So an acronym that John says is she, um, shrink, hide, embody. So shrink what isn't as important, hide what's not important at all, and then embody the most important features of um, or design artifacts of the, the tool you're building. Um, the next law is organize. So organization makes a system of many a few fewer. Um, and in fact, the scheme is necessary to achieve definitive success and taming complexity. Um, so always think about what goes with what. And another acronym John uses is SLIP, which is sort, label, integrate, and prioritize. So um, you know, when you're thinking about designing your products, it's super critical to organize things in a way that makes sense. Um, a common technique for this is card sorting. So let's say you're thinking about grouping filters in like a big panel. Um, you could um, draw, draw out each filter or um, so just so write it out on index cards and then bring it to users and ask the users to organize things in a way that makes sense to them. Um, I use that technique a lot and it's super helpful. On the next law is time. So savings and time feels like simplicity. Um, Waiting can be less subtle, but can also be tense or annoying. So um, users really attribute efficiency of quick interactions um, to simplicity of an experience. So whenever you can save time, do it. Um, you know, for example, the example I shared earlier of if you don't need to ask someone's gender, don't ask it. Um, it's stuff like that to save time that um, makes a better user experience. So next law is learn. Knowledge makes everything simpler. Um, often when users take time to learn a task, um, they feel like they're wasting time. It's a violation of the third law, but the approach of I don't need instructions, let me just do it, often takes longer than following directions. So when you're launching new products or features, you know you always wanna provide users with a tour and documentation. And um, John uses another acronym here called BRAIN. The so basics are the beginning, repeat yourself often, Avoid creating desperation, inspire with examples, and never forget to repeat yourself. Um, next, difference, differences, law five. So simplicity and complexity need each other. Um, you know, without the counterpoint of complexity, we wouldn't recognize simplicity when we see it. So make complexity consciously available in some explicit form. Um, an example I provide here, so as an enterprise designer, um, I'm always thinking about filtering and searching. So um, something simple like quick filters could be at the top of the page, but then having like um, an icon for advanced search and then making that complex um, or making it simple as, as you can, but it's still complex because this advanced search um, is you know example of the differences that balance each other out. Um, next context. So what lies in the per Periphery of simplicity is definitely not peripheral. So aim your designs to be a light bulb instead of a laser beam. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, a light bulb has its focus point in the middle and then it gradually gets darker as it moves around the circle opposed to a laser beam that's just pointing at one point. So the periphery is so important. 
Um, so you want to find meaning in everything around and use design to put more focus on the most important actions on the page. Um, a simple example here is primary and secondary buttons. So often you'll have a call to action that's like your like a blue button and the secondary buttons are white with like a blue outline um, that are it's still important, but it, it, it shouldn't out overweigh the primary action on the page. Um, next emotion. So uh, more emotions are better than less. Uh, although neutral color and minimalist form makes sense, it can be considered ugly and not enough contrast. So um, don't be afraid to use more uh, ornaments and layers of meaning. And um, media myths is, is, in is in contradiction to reduction, but reduction is also about being as complex as necessary. Um, and a simple example of this law is um, for negative CTA buttons, such as exit without saving, you know, it's often um, a red button to, you know, have the emotion of like, hey, if you do this, it's bad, um, not reversible. Um, so the next law is trust. In order for a product to gain trust, it has to prove itself deserving. And the other laws help because something simple to use is easier to trust. Um, so you want to avoid designs that look breakable. Um, you want to provide undo and redo options so users can backtrack steps and trust the system will help make things right. And another big topic in the, today's tech world is, you know, privacy of how your personal data is being used. So you always, when you use personal data, want to communicate to users how it's being used so they trust the system and the product. Um, law nine is failure. So some things can never be made simple. Um, there's definitely some flaws in this framework, um, but there's always a return on investment when you try to simplify, you know, following the double diamond approach and iterative product design, you know, you always learn from your mistakes. So it's important to conduct user testing, um, identify failures and move forward. Uh, one person's failed ex experiment and simplicity could be another person's success as a beautiful form of complexity. Um, and to, you know, identify failures following the double diamond approach again, you need to come up with multiple solutions and do A-B testing to move forward and iterate, iterate, iterate. Um, the last law is kind of a summary of all of them, which John calls the one. So simplicity is about subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful. Um, when something's too obvious, it's probably unneeded. With the obvious removed, the meaningful comes into view. So whenever you're in doubt, turn to this law. So those are the 10 laws. Um, highly advise that you buy his book to go a lot more in depth about these. Um, what's also helped me in terms of my design guidelines is the Nielsen-Norman um, usability heuristics. There's like 10 of them. Um, I would also study those when you're you know, trying to educate yourself about this field. And um, one of the links I shared with you guys is a white paper um, called Empowering Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender People with Co-Design, A Critical Evaluation Through the Lens of Simplicity. So this was a project that um, aimed to create a support system for LGP2 people um, with the means to survive and empower themselves. Um, so for example, they had this panic button um, so for people if they're in deep need and in danger, um, it could um, reach out for help. Uh, unfortunately, the article didn't have the final designs, but this is some of their iterations. Um, but some examples of how they use these laws. Um, so for law four learn, they discovered this multi-directional navigation menu was um, too difficult. So they iterated it into one. So that was um, learning how users interact with the product. Um, the removal of the help button in the top bar um, up here. So this is the help button. They removed it um, to not get confused with the SOS button. So that's you know law one reduce and law two organize. Um, they reduced the registration length time, uh, law three time, and then for trust, um, they decided that when they hit this SOS button, that it only go to registered partners to prevent malicious or unprepared people attending the calls. Um, so that's law I trust. And 
there's a lot of other other examples of how this project utilized the laws. So I'm not going to go fully in depth of that now, but definitely if you haven't already, um, I advise you to read this white paper um, to learn about how you could apply these laws in your work. So in conclusion, um, I think we're running out of time. Great. Um, apply the design process everywhere in life to build meaningful change. You know, the history of LGB2 campaigning um, design went through iterations to identify new problems that arise. Um, best US practices have emerged um, to empathize with trans and non-binary issues. And building a meaningful product requires extensive UX research and following design guidelines and heuristics um, to you know, make design inclusive and you know, identify real problems to be solved and um, build great products, like I said. And this is just kind of a, a fun thing I made, um, an analogy of a double diamond approach in my life. So you know, I always felt different. I was kind of discovering myself and these are all, th these are all true to myself, but there's also stereotypes. So don't take these um, as a word that this means you're gay because there's straight people that could do this too. Um, but ultimately always knew I was gay, but I thought I was straight um, just because I was so afraid of being gay. You know, I never, never had any role models. Um, and the only gay people I knew, like in school, were getting bullied. Um, so I kind of redefined the problem of feeling different, that I was afraid to be gay since I had no support or positive reinforcement. And then I made a plan, um, identified a lot of solutions. Um, so I told my family first. I waited until after high school to come out out of fear of being bullied. Um, I made my first gay friends in college. I joined SIGAP at UConn that had a lot of other gays. Um, made a Facebook coming out status, watch right, gay romance movies and enter the NYC gay community. And you know, lastly, I delivered the best version of myself and I'm super proud of um, my identity. And yeah, this, this is just a fun little conclusion approach I made. So, you know, in summary, discovering your personal and professional identity is very similar to the design process. Um, it's okay to try new things and change and not be sure about yourself. And when you're thinking about breaking in the UX field, as I said earlier, it's, a, it's very diverse with specialized roles. Um, you know, I thought I was going to be, you know, designing mobile apps. I ended up in enterprise software, which I really love. Um, you could um, be a UI designer, a UX researcher. You could be a design systems builder. You could work in AR, VR. Um, there's just so many ways to apply UX and it's okay to not be good at everything. It's, you know, just try new things and try your best and um, apply the design process everywhere in your life. So um, yeah, that, that's it for my presentation. Thank you for listening. I hope you all learned a lot and uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I know uh, Delaney and Haram have some questions that our students uh, taking diverse perspectives in digital media and design have prepared based on reading uh, those articles that you had suggested, as well as looking through your LinkedIn profile. So I'll turn it over to our co-discussion leaders and uh, our live audience on YouTube. We're keeping an eye on the chat. So please feel free to drop in your questions and we'll integrate those as well. Okay, so we know that you found your passion for UX and UI design as an undergraduate at, undergraduate at DMD. Um, we were wondering since then, how has your thinking about UX and UI changed over the past five years since then? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I guess when I first heard about UX, I really thought, um, I, I knew the UX research was important, but what I think is like another super important skill in UX is how you collaborate with others. You know, there's a lot of various um, compromises that arise in working with engineers. And, you know, I, I kind of came to the conclusion that 
you're not just designing, you know, you're, you're working with other people, you're building a team. So that definitely shifted my perspective of like, um, you know, being a leader and collaborating, I think, um, also that my joining enterprise software, you know, I thought that UX was all about user facing stuff and, um, you know, really thought about ways to achieve that, but, you know, working enterprise software, you know, I realized there's so many important sectors like B2B products, um, B2C, and uh, it's okay to, you know, specialize in one area, like I said. And I think also um, learning about design systems. Um, I didn't really know what a design system was before graduating and understanding, you know, setting up your product brand guidelines and all your components and understanding how powerful the design system really is, um, is super important and plays a really big role in my work and makes it easier. So, um, yeah, those are just some thoughts I just had. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, another question we had was when you're designing an interface or doing user experience, what do you have a, like a certain process you follow and what would those steps look like? Yeah, definitely. Um, so at all the companies I mentioned, we try to standardize our process, but obviously it's not linear. So you're going to go in some circles sometimes, but um, normally I have a stakeholder kickoff meeting when a project comes in the pipeline. And I always first like to question um, if the problem they suggested is a real problem. You know, often they'll jump straight to the solution and it's really critical to put your UX lens on and communicate to stakeholders like, hey, um, this is an assumption, like let's advocate more time for research. And, um, you know, once you have that, um, you get the green light to do more UX research. Um, I do desk research. I see what's out there. If anything's previously been done, <clears throat> I'll start recruiting users to interview and um, I'll make, I'll identify what I know about the problem and what I don't know and identify my gaps in research and, you know, think about um, how to set up my user interview questions. So then I'll do my user interviews. Um, Generally, like I said, I have leading questions, but it's important during the discovery process to let the user guide the interview. Um, you know, you don't want to interrupt them much because it's when the user leads it, you know, that's when you really dig deep and identify those aha moments. So I'll, and I'll record each interview and I'll often sometimes do surveys, you know, card sorting. Um, and then once I have, the recordings, I will make a synthesis of each interview. So, uh, and I split up the sections into like role, goals, um, pain points, wants, workflows, and behaviors, um, et cetera. And each interview is like, if it's 45 minutes, the synthesis ends up being like nine pages long. It takes forever. Probably the most tedious part about UX, but it's super critical. And then once I have all my interviews done and I synthesize them, I will go into Miro or FigJam, and for each data point, I will make a post-it and lay them all out. And then um, there's a quote I learned from Meta that's like, look at the forest and the trees and the forest and the trees again. So it's basically saying, when you have all your data points out, you know, group them in themes, you know, go in law, I think to organize. And um, once I have those themes ready, I will, um, it's also super important that you communicate this process with your engineers and product team. So I'll make a research deck um, that frames the, the problem, um, you know, create user personas, create user journeys. And once I have that user journey laid out based off real research and on assumptions, um, I'll do an exercise with my product team and engineers, you know, design charrette. Well, we'll, you know, think about the touch points in the user journey and come up with product features. Um, 
And then throughout that whole UX research process, obviously we'll identify the real problem to be solved. And then during that design charrette is when you ideate on solutions. Um, so I will do that. And I work with the product manager closely to identify like a, a feature list after that. And then I'll start with wireframing. Um, I like to make a couple of different low fidelity versions of my ideas. You know, like I said, you want to do A-B testing and it's okay to just show a user like um, a drawing on a piece of paper and see like, hey, what do you like better? You know, the the earlier you get that user feedback, the more important and critical it is and the more time you'll save in the long run. Um, so I like to do most of my work in low fidelity. I'll start off very basic wireframes. Um, then I'll move into grayscale. Um, it's a bit more higher fidelity, but still not like the final design. Um, and then I'll, I'll make prototypes in Figma. Um, I'll create user testing scripts. And um, you, normally I like to do at least five rounds of usability testing um, and then iterate, iterate, iterate. And then once you align on the best solution, that's when you pull in the design system and start doing the UI design. And like, like I said, uh, it's like the top of that iceberg diagram I showed you. That's just the, the final step. It's if you want to iterate quickly, it's better to start low fidelity. And um, yeah, that's my general process. I probably missed out some things, but hopefully that was helpful. So um, another question that we had was, what projects have you been most moved by or most passionate when working on? Yeah, that's a great question. I'd say um, definitely the live shot manager one I'm most proud of because, and just to recap, that was when we digitalized the NBC Live News workflow. Um, and I say that because it was the first tool of its kind to ever be built. So, you know, we we're building something from the ground up. Um, so I'm really proud of that. And I was moved by it because um, it really helps news and like get the news is super important in the world, you know, communicating um, important subjects and um, just helping be, being part of that. And that a lot of features in there for like breaking news situations when stuff could turn around. And it was just a really rewarding project that I'm really proud of. And I'd say um, the vulnerability management tool I made at Meta was also, I was really moved by it because you know, I learned a lot about data security risk and, um, you know, thinking about users' data, you know, I'm sure you're all on Instagram and Facebook and your, your data is important. You want it to be protected. So building a tool that protected users' data was um, super rewarding as well. Um, it's a very, it was so complex learning everything about like databases and um, how the how the vulnerabilities live in different areas, but um, I'm going through so many iterations of that tool. And right before I left Meta, I made a new version of it that was really well re received. So that was super rewarding. Um, and most of my work has been um, enterprise software. I definitely want to do some more side projects. You know, after doing this talk, maybe I'll identify LGBTQ issue and start building products around that. So. Yeah. Um, following that question, so you talked about what are your what you were passionate about. So, what are your biggest challenges, and how have you faced um, how how have you overcome them? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, I, I think a big challenge for me is design systems, actually, because. Um, at my first role at NBC, we didn't have one. We just started to build one when I left. And then when I was at Meta, another team managed the design system. So I felt like at Meta, my role was very UX focused and not so much UI because I was, you know, copying and pasting the components. And they had such a good design system. They actually have four for like Instagram, one for internal tools that I use. But now in my current role at Rocked, you know, we're Rather than being a massive design organization, we're just like six designers. So, um, you know, one of my challenges is becoming better at 
UI design and creating design systems. So, you know, I'm currently in the process of doing a Udemy course for creating design systems. And I've really challenged myself to start making one for a new product I'm building. Um, so that's definitely one of my challenges. I'd say another big challenge is um, working with engineers. So, you know, the, there's obviously a deadline to launch a product. And a lot of the times when you come up with new features, um, engineers are going to say, oh, that's too much work, right? But you're really going to be like, hey, um, this is user need identified and make the product so much better. So being very organized and um, showcasing your research and um, also like but having that disagreement in a very like um, political manner and not having too much emotions or feeling into it. Sometimes I get emotional and um, could be a sometimes aggressive, but I I'm overcoming that. And so I think like finding that middle ground, um, moving forward with engineers is definitely a big challenge. And um, say so one more challenge is recruiting participants like I, I said earlier it was easier in internal tools which it, it kind of is but um a lot of people are don't don't want to help they, they say oh, i'm too busy so um you got to be very persistent with recruiting and um it's super important to do it right because that's how you get that diversity of thought and you know build better products We know that you've been inspired by past work from LGBTQ plus um, community. Um, how has that inspired your current works now? Um, that's a great question. So um, I'd say that the some of the issues that arise of like different identities, um, you know, I have to think about, even though I'm not designing for LGBTQ people, um, because a lot of my work is these complex enterprise tools, so it's not necessarily related to the LGBT community, but a lot of the principles I shared, um, you know, thinking about, um, choosing people's pronouns or, um, just like being inspired by the challenges that LGBT people face and overcame them is, I kind of like to think about that work and the challenges I face in my day-to-days and, but um, yeah, like it, I'm, my work isn't super related to LGBT people now, but um, I'd say in the tech world, there is a very large um, support system for LGBTQ people um, at each company I've been in. And there's been like, currently there's rainbow rocks um, and we're always, you know, bouncing ideas off each other and inspiring each other so, um, yeah, so. Okay, so last question. Um, do you follow the AI trends um, and how do you see the developments in AI impacting your work and digital media and design like a whole? Yeah, I'm definitely now working at an AI company, so I'm up to date on it. Um, I think something recently that's been in the public eye is definitely like chat GPT, um, thinking about different ways designers could use it. Um, for example, um, one of the other designers on my team was like, hey, um, for desk research, was this asking questions, like show me how, for example, online advertisements um, are portrayed for the, this user group um, and pulled up really good information. Um, there's definitely a lot of articles out there that, you know, communicate how chat, chat GBT can be utilized. And, um, I, I think it's a powerful tool, but ultimately it's not going to replace human empathy. Um, maybe it will, maybe I'm wrong, but I think designers have something very special, um, of, of being able to empathize with people and um, solve problems and 
facilitate that collaboration that AI can't do. That's super critical for the design thinking process. Um, but I think AI is, you know, super powerful and it's still in its very early stages. So I think um, there's a lot of different ways it can be applied. And um, I, I'm new to an AI company. I've only been there a couple of years. So I'm, I'm still learning it, but it's definitely going to change the industry for the better, I think. Um, but there also needs to be a lot of safeguards in place to make sure that it doesn't become too powerful. Like, you know, um, you probably heard about like the, the AI apocalypse or something. So, um, yeah, we got to be really careful about making it humanizing it, but not too much. So, you know, it doesn't overcome our work. We did have one question uh, on the YouTube live coming from Mari, who uh, is one of our student athletes also in DMD. And uh, the curiosity there was, uh, did you ever feel that you could combine sports at the college level with your art, uh, even if it was or wasn't uh rowing yeah 100 percent. i was on the club swim team um i guess i didn't fully communicate that issue that was more like conflicting identity that my dad saw of me versus what i wanted to do but i swam competitively through high school and did the club team at college um which i really really enjoyed you definitely can have both um i guess my I expressed that conflicting viewpoint just because of like following my passion and why I went into the DMD, um, which, you know, if I wrote at some school, I probably wouldn't have been a DMD major and wouldn't be where I am. So, yeah. Um, you're on mute. <laughs> it always happens. It's got to happen. Uh and did participating in the club team and the kind of mentality that a competitive athlete needs, did, did that provide a boost uh, as you went out on the job market? Was it something that came up? I know our athletes are uh, really hardworking yeah. individuals. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, during interviewing, you want to sound like you're a human and not just a robot designer. So. <laughs> Um, you always want to have some icebreakers and like communicate your passions and yeah, you know, definitely the, the grit I learned through being, having like 5 a.m. practices and swimming in high school, um, you know, definitely set me up for success. And, um, yeah, I think it's, it's good to like show your interests during interviewing. Um, so yeah. Great, thank you. Kind of a fun segue. Mari, we'll have to talk one of these days because I was on the crew team at Syracuse. So I can talk to you about the difficulties in trying to double uh, your athletics and your art passion. And in the end, I will say art won. And I wouldn't be here today if I didn't let the crew go. Yeah. I, <laughs> for me, I, I, my, my dad made me do it. I, I like the rowing aspect, but I really didn't like the erging. And that's what like, the two Ks are just really brutal. I didn't want to do that, but it's a lot, it's a lovely sport. I would, and I'm not trying to put it down. No, not at all. It, but yes, it is exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, Andrew, I can't thank you enough for coming back to your DMD family and sharing all the incredible, um, amazing insight and knowledge you've gained in just like less than five years since you graduated. Like it's so inspiring. I'm so proud of you. And I'm so happy that you're back willing to share all of your, uh, all of your info with, with our current students. And yeah. Um, really of course. Um, really grateful you asked me to participate in this and I'm um, super happy to do it. And um, yeah, if any of you have, I mean, can I, can I paste in the chat? Um, yeah, absolutely. I'll put it in the... I'm going to put my portfolio link. Mm -hmm. And that'll have your contact there too, Andrew, right? Yeah. Which is perfect.
Um, I'll throw that in there. Excellent. So if you guys want to, you know, look at my projects in more detail, um, if you go on my portfolio, um, there is a password. I provided that as well. And then should, if you want to, you know, reach out for more questions or, you know, help, um, you know, Rock is my company, unlike a lot of tech companies are hiring a lot. Um, we do hire junior people. So um, if you're interested in joining Rock, you know, hit me up and um, we need great mentors, Andrew. That's the thing. I know you would be a fantastic, um, fantastic, fantastic mentor for our students. So I love that. Well, and I also want to thank Dr. Seglio and Delaney and Harum and everyone else for being here uh, on YouTube watching this uh, event. And um, I want to invite everyone to our third event of the series this year, next Monday, March 27th, also at 530 Eastern time. We're going to welcome Jane Wu, who's a creative director, director at Hero for Hire. Um, and she's going to discuss the visionary leadership of minority women in animation. Um, so again, uh, you can register for that. Uh, or just come back to the same YouTube channel. You'll see us here live at 5.30. Um, and check out all of the rich lineup for the rest of the semester at dmd.ucon.edu slash diverse. Subscribe to YouTube. Get our, follow us on social media at DMD uh, to see all, everything that's exciting and going on. And again, thanks everyone. Um, we have a ton of work to still be done in the area of diversity and inclusion within the digital media and design fields, but we continue these conversations and support each other and inspire each other and look at the new generation. Um, we've got a lot of wonderful things to, to look forward to in the future. So thanks all of you for being with you and we will see you next week. Bye everyone. Uh, thanks for listening and um, yeah, love wins. So have a good day and continue your career paths and you all do great. Let's believe in yourself. <laughs> awesome. All right. That's a wrap. All right. I'm going to log off.